Hello friends, I am architect Zahra Batul. I have completed my BARC and also done my MTEC in urban and regional planning. I am also pursuing my PhD currently. And today I am here to actually teach you and also learn with you what uh, 18 ARC 43, which actually comes under uh, 2018 CBCS scheme called as Building Services 1, Handling Water Supply and Sanitation. The whole subject is divided into five modules and I will be handling two modules for you where module one is basically going to take up all the you know uh, introduction relative to environment and health aspects and water supply and module two which is going to take up uh, sewerage system and stormwater management. The whole objective of this particular course is going to be uh, with respect to imparting knowledge and practical skills for you with respect to understanding essential services of water supply as well as sanitation and their integration into architectural design. So herewith we are going to begin with module 1. As in when we proceed with module 1 and module 2, I am going to talk to you about various aspects that are going to be covered in, in terms of our syllabus. Module 3, 4 and 5 will also be handled by another colleague of mine. Uh, Mrs. Rupashri, Professor Rupashri. So she will be handling with 3, 4 and 5. Alright, so when we basically look at the whole uh, subject in all, we are going to deal with module 1 today. Module 1 has two parts. One is introduction to environment and health aspects, which we are going to cater to the way history actually dealt with health and its sanitary aspects and then get on to water supply and its effects. According to the World Health Organization, around 1.8 million children under the age of 5 die every 20 seconds. That means we still have not won a battle that started more than 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, if you actually go back to what exactly was uh, the attribute of a civilization, sewage, human waste that even today continues to be lethal for millions of people was unavoidable and it existed with us because if you actually get back before Neolithic period, people were basically hunters and then they were harvesters. Everything was renewable at that time. Drinking water flowed from the sources as well as streams and the settlements only needed a premise. So that means the people there needed only a water source nearby and people were very careful about what exactly was happening around them. Around the 8500 BC, everything changed radically where people started to be producers and traders and that is when the population grew and people started settling down in cities. The urban settlements started coming in and people started working and living in groups. And this working in groups with a high population density which concentrated mostly on commerce, political power, handcrafted production gave in to a lot of waste and fecus. The first sanitation facility that we actually know or have read about in the history was the sump or the cesspit that appeared in the Babylonian period around the 4000 BC. That is when the hydraulic system of drainage was also developed. If you actually go back to history and try to see and understand where we started with Uruk was the first place where people started settling in. This is the current Mesopotamian region where people uh, started living in here. And why did the oldest city called Uruk come into existence? Uruk which is today's Iraq or also called as Mesopotamia in our history books during 3000 years back actually began as one of the city or one of the settlement because of the existence of these rivers. These rivers were sources of water for people and people started gathering in these kind of settlements such that it was closer for them to stay around water. Water was a source for people to start life with. And if you actually start seeing as to how we started 
communicating with people with respect to division of spaces. The first city of walls was Jericho. Jericho is also mentioned in the biblical revolutions if you actually know that this is one urban settlement which was located again very close to springs and other bodies of rivers and there are traces of wells that you see in Mesopotamia of today around the rainwater channels and even in the early bronze age of Mohenjo-daro where you can see that a lot of archaeologists have actually found hundreds of ancient wells, water pipes as well as toilets that existed in the modern Pakistan which is also called as the Mohenjo-daro region. If you go get back to how exactly we started working on developing and intercepting upon water supply, we see the first evidence of any purposeful construction which basically began with the usage of toilets was happening around the European continents that is the Minoan and the Mycenaean region of Europe. Jericho as I mentioned earlier is basically one by biblical revelation where people uh, where Jesus has basically spoken about how exactly this particular city existed in terms of coalition with respect to the people and its urban population growth. This is an image of an early dynastic period of the temple oval where you can basically see how exactly a ring drain has been constructed actually to understand how we started putting forward sewers and how we connected the whole water supply under the ground. This is also one of the first known toilets that was flushed at the palace of Gnosis on the island of Crete. You see all these kind of remains even today to actually understand how we started developing on the kind of you know waste system. Toilets were an essential feature in the Mohenjo-daro region where people have excavators have actually identified most of the toilets to be either post cremation sites or some post burial urns. This is one such brick structure which had a hole in the top and that was connected to a small drain leading out of the base into a regular basin and that is not seen in the image but early excavators suggested that this might have been a toilet. And there are other pictures also where you see two structures with a hole and a drain located and are thought to be toilets. Well, these two structures have been unique examples of toilets. Most people think that they could be old pots which were set into the ground and used as commodes. But if you get back to Rome and see the Romans were brilliant managers and engineers and the systems travel through modern technology. Rome's water system is one of the marvels of the ancient world where much is known and much has been written about Rome's water supply but however very less is being mentioned about their sanitary achievements. They recycled wastewater right at those times with the usage of the same water which comes out of this pass by using it to flush all the latrines before discharging it into the sewers and then into the rivers. So that is something that has to be commendable uh, with respect to the way the Romans started thinking about flushing down all the waste down the drain. These are certain ruins which were dug out at Mohenjo-daro with a large bath in the foreground. You see that lot of <coughs> bath bathing areas have been connected to this particular bath area. In the Mohenjo-daro you see a lot of buildings with latrines which are connected to a sewage system and these drains ran beneath the streets and the lanes and were large enough for workmen to enter and clear any of the obstructions. So it was very easy for all the men to actually enter into all the obstructions and then clear it up if there were any. This is also one corbel drain that you see in exiting out of a bath. So that means that is a bath area and the sewer was connected through this cobbled arch. The concept of hygiene basically developed during the Roman Empire and regulations were put in place to separate all the wastewater by means of a sewerage system in the streets. The latrine evolved as well and a seated one became widespread. 
replacing the previous system where defecation took place in a squatting position. However, the population continued throwing the excreta on the street until 100 BC when a decree obliged to connect all the households to the sewage system which experienced an outstanding evolution for us in terms of our services. If you look back to how exactly the cross section of pedestal lavatory was, it had a ring drain all right, and the floor was waterproofed with bitumen and then this was connected until the last course of the land and then connected onto the sewers. This is one such Roman sewer which uh, is kept in the museum of the forum of Casarugosta. Basically you see that these were the kind of spaces where people actually you know uh, developed to see and evolve in terms of how we work on our sewerage system. These are also certain images as to from where this pass water would enter into the sewage system and filter the water and flush the water out of the drains. The Romans actually if you know advanced in sanitation but were forgotten during the middle ages. The middle ages are very crucial for us to actually understand because un unlike Paris or only few cities which preserve some of the structure, most of the sewage system was absorbed by the urban sprawl which was developing. So many people started coming in and started working in the urban areas and world cities started evolving. As the cities started walling themselves up, the whole city started getting saturated. So the population also started throwing all the excreta onto the streets or outside the city walls. That is when the is called as the age of filth. During the middle ages, most of the waste was put out on the streets and that gave rise to the age of filth where rats thrived among the excreta and epidemics began of cholera and plague killing almost 25 percent of the population at that time. But no advances were made in sanitation. Cities were putrid and the maximum hygiene level was reached only in the rural areas. The urban level areas were stinking and peasants were burying the fecus in a hole. So you see a couple of images where you, uh, you know, from the uh, Board of Health from the Edwin Chadwick's book, he says that there were a lot of uh, unpleasant and unhealthy smells which were actually coming into the atmosphere and affecting the whole living schedule of people there. So it actually gave rise to a lot of deaths, it gave rise to something that we actually have to think about if we are not very careful about how we are letting out our waste. So this was one time when many people died, the whole population was flushed out only because people were not very concerned about their health and hygiene. But there was a time when the Tudors came in during the middle ages and they were considered to be a certain group of people who actually developed some kind of you know. Uh, system where they would bathe every day and they would, this is one such image where you see the towels were put up along the rings and these rings were where people would actually bathe and then powder themselves and even have public gatherings around them. And then during the late 1800s you see that the human waste was starting to give up one kind of uh, problem to the people and then that is when we started working on cesspools. So what is a cesspool? Cesspool is where we are basically trying to do something under the ground. We are, we are trying to cal collect or coagulate all the water which comes out of all the residences and put it down onto the ground which is almost like 6 feet below the ground. The whole section if you actually understand the section, the section would have be covered with a flagstone that is the ground line, the flagstone which is covering it. And that is the vent letting out or emitting out all the uh, foul smell, the sewer pipe which would almost be like 50 feet in length and then it is going to be connected to the uh, <coughs> cesspool's bottom. So this is one of the diagram of an old fashioned cesspool that actually began in history. And during this particular time when Europe was uh, 
you know, in ruins with respect to sanitation in terms of not understanding what exactly is needed with respect to health and hygiene, Arabs were the first people in the Iberian Peninsula who established sanitation rules. So, they were the ones who brought in rules with the objective of separating three types of water, rain water which was essential for life, grey water which originated from domestic activities and then wastewater. Now, why did they do this? Why did these rules came up? These rules came up because, because of the Arabian culture which was born in a difficult climate. This climate valued rain water as if it was a divine endowment and it carefully conducted to the cisterns for its conservation and subsequent usage. Here we first see something called as grey water. So, now what is domestic grey water? This was the water which is removed from the patios of the houses through underground drains or pipes on the surfaces while wastewater is had to be having an independent pipeline towards the cesspits. So, that is where both of them merged with the grey water. So, this is one such example of how a sewer came up with respect to construction of a cesspool. And if you actually understand the way we were urbanizing our cities, uh, within 50 years you would see the amount of people, this is this one particular box is 10,000 people. So, we were growing in multiples with respect to each of the cities, even London, London was growing in you know five times its multiplicity, Edinburgh, Glasgow. If you look at the whole European peninsula, you see a lot of growth in the, in the 50 years. And in these 50 years, that is when the, all the sanitation rules started working and developing so that people would actually try to give some kind of an importance with respect to their health and hygiene. And uh, if you look at how the urban settlements were, the tenements also called as tenements here, they were like apartments where all the people would be living together and not very concerned about how their surroundings were. So, their planned cities, even there was a lot of urban renewal which was required, their houses were crowded, their um, spaces were unlit and they uh, were unhygienic. So, this paradox of the renaissance did not go hand in hand with the advances in sanitation. So, this gave us a halt while the cities kept growing. The filth and the odor in nearly almost all the European cities during the 17th century was unbearable. Open edification was common in many neighborhoods as well as cesspits were saturated. Meanwhile, all the citizens continued throwing the excreta into the sewers which were open ditches basically and then partially discharge them into the rivers. So, this is one such uh, example of how uh, the danger of filtering all the wastewater into the drinking water was being done without the joints being sealed is seen here. So, this is the cesspit and that is the drinking water connection and this was not sealed properly. So, th there was no basically now, uh, there was no stoppage of this mingling with this. Then came a progress which was made in hydraulics at that time which was applied to both collection as well as distribution of water, but it did not reach sanitation. With respect to water, Paris was one paradox because the city reached the highest levels of filth in its history in the mid 17th century. And the most beautiful fountains, ponds and canals were created for Louis XIV at the gardens of the palace of Versailles. That is when the crystal palace also came in. That is when the first uh, uh, you know expo, this, uh, the world expo came in and then people were actually trying to understand Paris at that moment because industrialization was happening. And when all of this was happening, you could see that the people were not actually considerate about their sewage as well as their waste disposal. And that is when we saw a lot of medicinal uh, advancements because of the existence of all these epidemic diseases like cholera, tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid and typhus which basically came in because of our unhygienic conditions. And then in Germany, we see 
one of the main sewerage system being planned in one of the cities of Hamburg, where you know the whole principles of sewers were considered to actually understand a city and its exit system. So, the situation in London was also very similar to Paris. So, although this particular English capital had started the renaissance period with several hygienic rules on the cleansing of drains which were implemented by Henry VIII, the city stank and many cesspits oozed in different neighborhoods. But here what they did was they started working on modern toilets which appeared to be well off homes of the capital and this was one of the such modern toilet invention which was done by John Harrington also called as the Harrington commode because the water used from the tank was the, there was a tank and there was water which would wash down the latrine and take the waste to the cesspit and its objective was basically to eliminate all the unpleasant odors of the urinals in the rooms and the close relationship between filth and diseases was not clear until the mid 19th century. So, this is one such example of uh, how a whole prixi was fixed up. The advances in microbiology actually began here and people started thinking about treating all the wastewater at the end of the 19th century and by 1914 there were a lot of engineers like Edward Arden and William Lockett who discovered something called as active sludge which is one of the biological wastewater treatment system which we still use even in our existing water treatment plants. So, if you go back to history with respect to human civilization and see how sanitation, hygiene and cleanliness were the hallmarks of a civilized society right from historic times to Roman times, then came the dark ages, sanitary dark ages and then the age of sanitary enlightenment and the industrial revolution where people started basically developing basic treatment processes after the 1800s and then the age of process development came in and then refinement of all these processes happened after the 1960s where stringent environmental standards came in and then we see this kind of a timeline with respect to the development of sanitation system. So, why am I saying all of this? I am trying to give you an idea of how important health, hygiene and cleanliness is with respect to how a city develops. So, for us good health is not only freedom from sickness as well as diseases, but complete absence of anxiety, social and psychological tensions. If there is any kind of deviation in harmonic functioning of our body, our health gets affected and we may also get sick. So, what affects our health? 1. Nutrition, 2. Sanitation and hygiene, 3. Genetic disorders, 4th is social and psychological factors and we are considerate of the second factor which is sanitary and hygiene. So, maintaining proper sanitation and good hygiene practices are necessary for all our healthy living. Sanitation means all measures that promote proper disposal of both human as well as animal waste and it also includes disposal of hazardous waste from hospitals, industries and other sources. So, what do you do? You basically start maintaining toilets and avoid open defecation. How? We start educating the young and start set of practices to preserve our health. According to the World Health Organization, hygiene is a condition and a practice that helps us maintain our health as well as prevents the kind spread of diseases. So, one of the most effective ways for us to protect ourselves and from other diseases is to practice personal hygiene. So, did you realize that without water we cannot maintain sanitation and hygiene? So, water, sanitation and hygiene are collectively termed as WASH, WA water, S sanitation and H hygiene. Since water, sanitation and hygiene are interdependent, these are grouped together as WASH. For example, proper sanitation cannot be maintained in toilets without water. Similarly, water is essential for personal hygiene such as washing hands, taking bath, etcetera. 
If there are no toilets, people are compelled to defecate in the open. So, this practice of defecation in the open may affect health in many ways. The fecal matter and the germs it contains gets washed away when it rains. So, and where does it get washed away to the nearby water sources such as ponds, lakes, streams and rivers which we are consuming uh, and it contaminates all the water. And in many cases when toilets are not constructed as per the norms, these toilets directly discharge all the water into the water bodies and it may also be a cause of water contamination. So, if you actually try to see and understand health and hygiene, there is also a report by the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund that is the UNICEF which published in 2016 that an estimated 5.2 lakh children under the age of 5 die annually from diseases from water that means almost 1400 every day and most of them are happening in our developing countries. So, what I am trying to tell you is health is interdependent on water sanitation and hygiene and water sanitation and hygiene is connected to water health. So, we are going to be co-dependent upon it as we transcend through our generations. So, what do we do? First thing that we have to understand is sanitation is one of the basic determinants of quality of life as well as human development in index. So, early concept of sanitation was only limited to disposal, but here we are also considering the concept of disposal with liquid as well as solid waste, food hygiene, personal domestic and environmental hygiene. So, how does that work? That works right at the source which is the fecus. Fecus could be in terms of fluids, flies, fields and fingers. With respect to all of these things when it comes in touch with food then it moves to the new house. So, that is how transmission route of diseases happens due to lack of sanitation. But if there is sanitation, if we are going to control it. So, sanitation, hand cleansing, uh, sorry hygiene and water. So, these are the three aspects that I was talking about. So, when flies, fields, fluids, food and hand cleansing come together. If we have traditional pit toilets or flush toilets, then sanitation comes into picture and we are controlling this right there. When we are clean, cleaning our hands with the right amount of water quantity without wastage of water, then there is enough hygiene with us. And if you are covering a food and having proper water with the right kind of quality, then our healths are also protected. So, you know coming together, if you actually wash if we do not have uh, proper sanitary conditions, then that is when all these infectious diseases spread. Otherwise, you can directly take care of both health, latrine as well as domestic and personal hygiene by trying to stop the fecal as well as oral transmission. So, what are the diseases that are spread through water? There are, there are four types of water spread diseases. One is water borne diseases like cholera, typhoid, amoebic and bacillary dysentery, diarrheal diseases, water wash diseases like scabies, trachoma, flea lice and tick borne diseases, water base diseases and water related insect vector diseases. So, what I mean is when these spreads they are going to go to the new host. But once we tr try to keep a check upon it by bringing in safe water, by covering the foods or by bringing in our sanitation facilities, then the spread does not work on the new host. So, that is what these images are all about. <coughs> so, the most important that we have to understand is most of the diseases that are transmitted are basically by either through the fecal oral route or by vectors. So, uh, the bacteria, virus and protozoan are the three types of diseases that are spread through the fecal uh, and then they bring in the waterborne diseases. So, we have to actually understand the mechanisms here. The mechanisms are either by contamination of water, sanitation which is poor personal hygiene which is also poor and contamination of the crops. 
So, what do we do? So, for this the vision of the government of India is basically with respect to the million and developmental goals. The goal 7 of 2015 talks about how a proportion of people without improved sanitation facility can work in terms of sanitation for all. So, Indian government also brought in the sanitation for all by 2012 and established its campaign called the total sanitation campaign which talks about all Indian cities and towns becoming totally sanitized, healthy as well as livable and ensure to sustain good public health and environment. And then here we are going to basically focus on hygienic and affordable sanitation facilities for both urban poor as well as urban women. So, the first campaign was the rural sanitation in India. So, this is one of the first national wide program for rural sanitation with the central government basically launched it in 1986 with an objective to improve the quality of life of rural people and to provide privacy and dignity to women. The program was reconstructed in April 1999 which focused on the demand driven approach in a phased manner with a view to cover a wide range of rural population by the end of the ninth fire plan. The Department of Water Supply and Sanitation is responsible for the sanitation in rural areas. Next came the TSS which is the total sanitation campaign a program which is also brought up to ensure sanitation facilities and to eradicate open defecation. The major, major goal of, of this particular scheme was to stop open defecation by 2012 and it followed a principle of no to low subsidies where nominal subsidies were given in form of incentives for construction of toilets. So, people were educated and they were taught about both sanitation as well as hygienic issues. Then came the Nirmal Gram Puraskar. This is also an inventive incentive scheme for those Gram Panchayat blocks and districts which have attained 10 percent sanitation coverage in their respective geographical areas. So, whichever Gram Panchayat or village or taluks had 10 percent sanitation and in eradicating the menace of open defecation and provided proper sanitation facilities in both their residences and educational institutions were given PRIs depending on the population for creating other sanitation infrastructure as well as maintenance. Then came the rural sanitary mart and this played an important role in facilitating supply of sanitary products and services in the rural India. Its function was to accelerate the pace of sanitation program and to provide need based and economically viable sanitary options. So, a lot of um, products came in here and almost 0.36 million Anganwadis gained safe sanitation facilities here. 1.05 million schools in the country were provided with sanitation facilities in the last decade. And then came Ecosan latrines. This was also one more um, you know program by the government where all the latrines. So, this basically is uh, 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 cubicle which uh, takes in uh, you know all the waste and this waste is again fed onto the crops which uh, the uh, liquid is actually absorbed by the sun and the solid is put down onto the ground and, and then the same is utilized for growing of crops. So, this was the cycle which was seen in ecosan latrines and then if you actually see the rural sanitation facilities, Sikkim became the first state to achieve 100 percent rural sanitation coverage becoming the first Nirmal Rajya in the country. It increased its uh, sanitation purities and by, by around uh, 20, uh, 25,000 villages started working with respect to rural sanitation and the central government budget also started increasing with from 1650 million to 16500 million by the next fire plan. And these were some of the issues that we noticed in India with respect to urban sanitation which is poor awareness. People were not actually aware of the priorities that sanitation brought in and poor institutional arrangements. There were a lot of gaps with respect to roles and responsibilities at national, state as well as city level. 
people were lacking with respect to their approaches in terms of integration of sanitary investment and it did not reach the urban poor in terms of uh, you know space constraints, economic constraints as well as lot of urban poor were unable to access safe sanitation and there was a lack of demand with respect to responsiveness. So, a policy came up for the urban people as well which is called as the national urban sanitation policy which was first brought in to create awareness with respect to sanitation and its linkage to public and environmental health. Opentification was brought in to all the cities and it promoted all the households with safe sanitation facilities by proper planning and management of community toilets. And then with which lot of city wide integration sanitation development came in with respect to planning, implementation and management. So, the role of government at national and state came up along with urban local bodies where people started getting aware with respect to the standards, funding, assistances and mainstreaming of both urban infrastructure with respect to each of their housing and then capacity building and trainings were given with respect to monitoring and evaluating city level and planning and financing was done at local bodies. So, with this lot of urban development also happened in terms of sanitary you know schemes, toilets came in, on site storages came in, the cesspits started working with respect to different types of septic tanks, intercepted tanks, double peach pits and double pits and transportations also though we were very dependent on manual labor at one particular period of time. Then periodic sludge development came in and with respect to which we started working on how exactly treatment also came in and local sludge uh, treatment plants were put up and wastewater treatment plants were also put up to actually integrate all these systems. The last system which came up in the urban uh, process was the DVAT system, it is based on mechanical as well as biological wastewater management. The main feature of DVAT was to low the operation as well as the management of a treatment system. So, sedimentation and primary treatment in settlers, septic tanks and tanks were provided. And with this a lot of aerobic and anaerobic treatments were done in terms of uh, you know treated water, untreated water, biogases and sludges. <coughs> so, with this we end with the introduction to environment and health aspects and we are closing with uh, the first part of the module 1. Thank you.